Hi guys, my name is Tom Antos and I'm excited to show you today uh, the Atomos Shogun. It's a new monitor slash recorder. Uh, and, uh, but aside from that, actually, I'm going to do a tutorial about sort of explaining, you know, about some of the features that both this monitor has, but also that you can find in your editing programs. Uh, use, you know, th th these techniques basically for when you're doing full color correction and the things like, for example, uh, vector scope histogram, how you use that, things like that. So, so for those of you guys who don't know what the Atomos Shogun is, it's actually a, a really good monitor and an amazing, you know, built-in uh, 4K video and audio recorder has some really, really high-end high specs, which I'll get into in, in a minute. Comes with everything that you need, as you can see, this nice case and everything, which is what, uh, which is really nice because a lot of, you know, high-end monitors actually out there don't come, don't come with things like that. Uh, here's the monitor itself. I've had a chance to use it for the last two months. Um, now, just quickly sort of talking about the build quality of the monitor. It is, uh, you know, I guess comparing to how much you're paying for this, as the whole thing costs $2,000 right now, it is, uh, I was a little bit disappointed because it's not as sturdy. It's actually just kind of, it feels kind of cheap plasticky. The screen itself is great quality and the image quality is amazing. It's full 1080. So the quality of the, of the actual image that you're getting in the color reproduction and sharpness, all that stuff, you know, the contrast is amazing. But just when you're really looking at it around up here, when you're holding it, it's, you know, it's not built out of like a solid, I don't know, you know, alloy, for example, materials or something. So if, you know, and I've heard already stories of some people dropping this thing and uh, and basically the, the whole body of it just cracking or falling apart. So one thing to watch out for. Another maybe disappointing thing is the vents here. I know, you know, they probably had to do these big vents because, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of computing power inside this little package. But again, maybe just the placement of it or something. It's, you know, I can see this being a big problem if you're shooting outside and want to use this as a field monitor because these big vents, any little bit of drops of water get in there and it could really seriously damage the, the monitor. So that's one thing. Aside from that though, it is, you know, considering again how much uh, functionality this has, it's not that big. Um, you know, as you can see, it's you know, not the thickest out there. Now at the same time, it's not the smallest monitor, but it's, it's a pretty decent size. Uh, has SDI connection, you know, in and out. Uh, it's, it's a 12G SDI, has HDMI in and out, has headphones, uh, has a remote plug-in up here. And also a really cool thing that I know a lot of people totally missed is that aside from it being just a good video recorder, it's actually a really good audio recorder and it comes with this basically audio breakout uh, box right here connection. And uh, let me just take out the cable here. The, the case comes with a lot of accessories actually and uh, it comes with these two sort of layers. And this is the cable here. So it's actually a really, really good quality uh, audio recorder. So you can, you know, basically plug this in here let's put it in and you know it kind of adds a little bit to the weight but as you can see you have full size uh, xlr input and outputs uh so you can you know and it also provides phantom power so you can use this to you know to record audio if you if you just wanted to record audio for example or really good audio and video at the same time uh it has the you know, the the power adapters like i said for the monitor itself and has a adapter and a charger for the batteries this one uses the Sony NPF style batteries. Um, so this is the charger for it. And it comes with one battery. Now the battery itself is the small one. It's, you know, it's not gonna last you very long. So that's one of the things about this monitor you just gotta be aware of is that it, it, it eats up the batteries pretty fast. And, you know, it's part, part of it is, you know, because of the processing power. So especially if you're recording in 4K versus 1080p, I notice a huge difference. Like. If you're recording in 4K, this little battery will last you, you'll be lucky if it lasts you like half hour. Um, whereas if you're recording in 1080p, it might last you even, you know, a little, slightly over an hour. So, you know, it's it's not horrible on the batteries, but it's not the best either. Also comes with this uh, sort of a DTAP adapter, so you can connect V-mount and, you know, Anton Bauer batteries. So that's a really cool thing. Uh, uh, another thing you also you'll need uh, for it is it uh, is a S a SSD, you know, basically solid solid state drive, and the way you attach the drive is you it comes with a you know five of these hard drive caddies, which is basically just these enclosures. You put it in there, and then it's very easy. You just slide it in through the back, and you have it there. And like I was saying, you know, to really power it, I would recommend getting these big you know big size NPF batteries. Uh, so now one thing, you know, it's really important to consider is the fact that, you know, to really use all the capabilities of this you know, amazing recorder, uh, you have to add in, like I said, the SSD, the batteries, and also the, the XLR connections. 
uh, that once you add all, all that stuff in there, it's actually, this thing becomes pretty heavy. Uh, with the smaller batteries, it's 650 grams. Uh, with everything really in it, it's gonna be close to, you know, one kilogram. So it's it's not something I would recommend attaching to like a like a Hachu mount on a DSLR. You could you know break it. So just be aware of that. Uh, and I think you know really if you want to like I said use this on sort of run and gun productions, uh, we really you know if you're using a DSLR camera, you really need to have a, a good st sturdy sort of uh, a camera cage that you can then you know use like a magic arm to attach it to. Now the good thing is it has attachments here on the bottom and on the top as the standard you know uh, the tripod mount you know screw attachments so you can attach it there and it's you know those attachments are pretty sturdy so that's a good thing uh so you know as you guys you can see up here I'm, i plugged it into the camera that i'm recording my cell phone so you can see you can see two two uh, the double of me um anyways uh, the the quality really to judge the quality of this monitor you got to see it with your own eyes it is really really good quality it's like i said full 1080p resolution but aside from that i think you know at seven inches the resolution i don't think matters as much really what what impresses about this monitor is just the color reproduction and the contrast it is and also the viewing angle like i mean right now i'm seeing it pretty much 180 degrees and it there's no difference versus that and if i look and sort of straight down onto the, the monitor so really good now uh, it was a little bit disappointing though when i was using it outside actually so one thing to keep in mind uh, because i think it's just because the the, the lcd screen up here is the, the, it's very very reflective the surface so when you're in, indoors, for example, like I am right now, you know, in a sort of studio setting, like I said, it's beautiful, beautiful quality monitor. But when you're outside, it is a little bit, you know, too reflective for, for my taste. And also it's because of that, then, you know, you don't see all those nice colors and, and the contrast in there. So definitely you'll, you know, it's, you, you need like a really good, you know, sunshade for this, you know, and, and I, would, I would suggest like one of those really kind of longer tube shades, uh, if you can, you know, uh, put it on there to really be able to use the full, functionality basically of this now uh, aside from it just being a really good quality monitor like i said it's uh, records 4k and it records in dnx hd uh, avid codec but it had uh, the i think the biggest you know the feature of it is it records in apple prores uh, uh, apple prores uh, uh, hq uh, 422 and uh, lt so you have you know all those you know like i said different quality settings and it records up to full cinema f uh, 4k so really amazing, uh, you know, the, the fact that you consider, like I said, it's a, it's, it's a monitor and a really powerful, you know, uh, recorder that records in Apple ProRes. So it's a great codec. It also supports, for example, the raw input from cameras like the, the Sony FS700 uh, from some of the, the C line, you know, from, from Canon cameras. Uh, so it has a lot of cool features like that. Has, uh, for example, LUT support. So you can put in your own LUTs, for example, 3D LUTs. So let's say, you know, if you're filming, for example, with cameras that are uh, S-Log or, for example, C-Log from the, the, the Canon line of cameras uh, that produce a really flat looking image. Well, the great thing about this is that you can real time apply a, a 3D LUT and sort of get a, a very good estimate of how the final image is going to look, which is very helpful, especially if, for example, if you have a, a client, you know, on set and you want the client to be able to see something, you know, like, a, like an image with a little bit of life in it versus it being really flat looking, you know, which, which is usually the case with, with S-Log, for example, or, or C-Log kind of uh, uh, images. Uh, it has really cool features such as, you know, the waveform, you know, vector scope, that kind of stuff, so you can really judge your exposure and your, your cold temperature. But it also has, uh, you know, it has zebras, has peaking, but the really cool function is the, the false color, which is a, an amazing tool for judging just how well you're exposing your image. So, you know, I'll get into that in a second, just sort of how you use it. Um, and also aside from that, it just, you know, it has so much functionality simply because it's, uh, like I said, the computing power of this thing is really powerful and it has a really good responsive touch screen. So it's very easy to navigate through the menus. And like I said, you can quickly jump in and out. You can change all the settings for, you know, whether it's the quality that you want to record to, uh, for example, if you want to slate the shots, you can put in shot information, all that stuff. Uh, also has a time code in and out so you know if you want to use it with a time code slate for example for like a bigger higher end production you can do that uh, really, really really cool features that you know i think this is pretty much the first time that i've seen a field monitor have all these things built into it now a lot of people ask me you know uh, for my opinion of whether you know they sh I, I recommend that they buy this this recorder you know considering that it is two thousand dollars after all so it's not, not the cheapest out there uh 
and it really i think that that depends on what kind of a camera you you, you own already and sort of you invested in and also what's your budget i would say if you have the, the panasonic gh4 and that's your sort of your main camera then this recorder even though it, it was designed to work with it and works very well with it i in my own experience i found that there's really almost no difference. So it's, it, you know, it, when, it, when you compare the quality of the internal recording of the GH4 versus here. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a difference because obviously the GH4 records in uh, only 8-bit uh, image versus this one records in full 10-bit uh, 422. So it has it records a lot more color information. But I would just simply say that, you know, for majority of the, of the kind of the shots that you'll be getting, the, there really is not that much of a difference. So unless you have some really slight gradient changes, like let's say like an, uh, you know, pure blue sky, for example, uh, you know, in, in situations like that, those extra bits of color are going to come in handy. Uh, but otherwise, I, I, in my tests that I've done so far, like you can see up here, I have you know, some shots I got of my dog. Uh, this is here internally on the GH4, and this is the same shot here, uh, recorded in 10-bit uh, 4 to 2 Apple ProRes on the uh, Atomos Shogun. And as you can see, the, 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 there really is no, no difference in there in the quality. And even you know, when I posted these, these tests that I did online, and I you know, allowed people to download the, the, the full 4K files, so they could really go sort of pixel peeping and really try to look you know, for differences, Pretty much nobody out there could find any differences. So like I said, in the kind of shots where there's a lot of details, especially a lot of texture, those extra bits of colors are not going to be noticeable because the changes are more, you know, like I said, there's too much of a contrast in the shots. So it's not to say that the recorder doesn't do a good job. It, like I said, it records amazing, you know, 10-bit 4 to 2 uh, 4K recordings. But I, I would almost say that it almost speaks re really well, you know, these tests kind of show you just how well the internal recording in the Panasonic GH4 are. That even though it's, like I said, it's an 8-bit image, the 4K recording that you get right out of the camera is so good that you really don't see that much of a difference and definitely does not justify, you know, spending $2,000 just to get that few extra little bits of color. And, you know, and also, like I said, the, the GH4 records already in 4K, so you don't need it for that. Now, for example, if uh, the other camera that this was, you know, really sort of made for is the Panasonic or it's, it's Sony, the Sony A7S, uh, which is a really amazing low light camera, and it's also 4K capable, but it's it does not allow you to record 4K internally. So if that's the camera that you're using, then I think you know this this recorder is something you should probably consider, you know, investing in because. It's like I said, the camera itself records amazing, you know, 1080p images. But with this recorder, you're just gonna unlock that 4K capability, and it just records also on a slightly better codec too. So, uh, like I said, if for the Sony A7S, I would say, yeah, uh, it's it's probably a good investment to have, uh, and it's mainly just for the 4K recording. But if you're using it with like, you know, like I said, the Panasonic GH4, or even with like the Canon cameras, like the uh, 5D, uh, you're, you're, you're not really gonna, I don't think you, it's, it, it warrants, you know, spending extra $2,000 for that little bit of extra, uh, of, of, of color, you know, depth information. Uh, now, if you just simply need a really good monitor, then again, this is, you know, I think a great option, but is it necessary? Again, it depends, you know, depends what kind of really functionalities that you need. If you just want to monitor like some, like a bigger, basically screen so you can judge, uh, whether your shots are in focus and what, what, whether you can do, you know, some quick composition, then there's a lot of options out there that are way cheaper. You can get even a monitor that I, I've been using recently from a company called Aperture, and it's uh, on two hundred dollars only. And it, like I said, it will do those things, and it's a, it's a lot smaller, sort of or lighter, sort of monitor, easier to mount on a DSLR. So that might be another option that you might want to go for. So. It really, like I said, uh, to answer like the question of whether you should get the Atmos recorder, it comes down to I think what the camera, what what camera you have, and and really what's important to you. Um, now let me get into sort of the details of the, the sort of the cool uh, uh, functionality that the monitor has. First thing I'll show you guys is the the waveform. So uh, it, you know, if other way you can refer to as a histogram. It's sort of well, this is slightly better I think than a histogram because a histogram is uh, is kind of shows you exposure. Uh, from left to right basically means left all the way left is uh, underexposed all the way right is overexposed whereas waveform will actually show you here you can tap on this you can change the size of it so as you can see this will actually show you in the image for example all the way from the left so this is the le left left side uh, le left side of the frame and as you can see if I move my hand 
the histogram also changes in there or if I move my head so it's actually showing you right now in that part of the, the frame where it's basically becoming over or underexposed as you can see here where uh, nothing really reaches 100 100 is the top line there so that's sort of how you would ju judge a waveform uh, so nothing really reaches 100 it's all within like between 80 and like 90 it says up here the line so that's pretty good that means that we're not overexposing any any, any of, the, of the you know like i said parts of the image now there are you know a lot of it is here basically in the 20 between 20 and zero that means that there's a lot of shadows but that's okay because as you can see behind me there's there's a lot of dark here in, in this in, in, in this sort of lighting setup that i did uh, so that's sort of how you would judge it so but in general you want kind of more of the these sort of because you can see those lines they're in the center so you know you don't want anything to go all past 100 you don't go you don't want anything to go past uh zero because that just means that there's no information there it's just either you know completely white blown out pixels or completely black you know underexposed pixels so that's one thing now i'm gonna for example have my assistant there change the exposure on the camera so i'm gonna have him uh, if, if bring down the the shutter speed uh, to like 1 25th of a second so as you notice is when he does that it's going to increase the exposure so i'm going to be getting brighter and also if you look here on the waveform monitor you can see that everything kind of jumps up and uh, now i'm going to have him underexpose the image so we'll go to maybe like 1 200th of a second and as you can see as he adjusts it i'm getting darker and as you can see all that information is getting darker here too uh, so we'll go back maybe to uh, the original setting which was 1 50th i believe so that's sort of how you would judge a waveform monitor and again this if you have waveform monitors in your editing application for example uh, and you're doing color correction that's how you can judge whether your image is sort of properly balanced whether it's not too or, or underexposed uh, next one that that's really cool that this monitor has is the the it's also a waveform but it has the rgb um, you know you can use that so if you actually want to see a specific color basically whether you know the channel how how it's doing then you can sort of judge it by that so again it's the same thing but it's just now it displays the separate colors for you and again it just shows you from you know from zero all the way to 100 you can sort of judge so as you can see up here the we have most of the information here in the red channel and that that one goes you know way higher than for example the the blue channel and you know it makes sense because when you're looking at this shot you know i have you know warm skin tones and also you see the warmer sort of furniture here the couch that i'm sitting on so it, it makes sense that it has that so that's sort of how you can judge and sort of you know make sure that your, your shot is properly balanced um and the next thing that this monitor has and it's a really also just a powerful tool and whether like i said whether it's you know in your field monitors or if you're doing color correction is the vector scope so vector scope it's sort of like a like a circle sometimes it's going to be displayed and it shows you where more of the information is basically of the pixels so which color it kind of goes to so you have you know red uh, you have the cyan green you know yellow magenta and blue and if, depending on where this thing goes that means that that's where more of that information is so right now it's as you can see this if everything like I, if you want to have a perfectly balanced shot let's say you don't want to have too much you know warmth or cold sort of colors in, in the shot then you want pretty much all of that information to be right there in the, in the middle, you know, basically of, of the vector scope. I right now though, because I on purpose, I exposed it and I want kind of a warmer feeling. So like I said, whether it's my skin tones or this warm kind of, you know, uh, kind of brownish furniture that I'm on the couch that I'm sitting on, uh, that's kind of what I actually want to have in the image. So as you'll notice, the vector scope is, is in the middle, but then some of the information goes to the yellow and the red channels. It starts going in that direction. But if, for example, if I were to adjust the, the white balance, I'm going to have my assistant change the white balance from, uh, which right now it's daylight because I'm using daylight balanced, you know, LED lights on me. I'm going to have him change it to, for example, uh, tungsten lighting. So now, you know, I changed the white balance in my camera to tungsten, which because I'm using daylight balanced, you know, lights, I, everything becomes very blue. And as you can see, the vector scope really shows that. So. As you can see more it, it's, it starts in the middle and then goes all the way here between the blue and cyan channels basically so that's how you can judge really if, if the white balance of your shot is is, is, is is you know is perfectly set by using the the vector scope like i said um, and so what why this might be useful is might especially for example if you're let's say you're using it as a, as a field monitor and you have a vector scope available in, in there and let's say the monitor doesn't show the colors very well 
well, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to judge the, you know, by looking at the actual colors in the monitor. Uh, you can just simply look at the vector scope and the vector scope will tell you right away that your shot is really blue or really warm or yellow, all that stuff. So like I said, it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, you don't have to rely on the, on the visual sort of, uh, you know, actually looking at the, the colors of the, sh of the shot. So it's, it's a really, really powerful tool. And it's also good when you're doing color correction because also then in the color correction pro stage, you can really sort of judge whether you're getting that feeling of the shot. Let's say if you are doing like, let's say, let's say, you know, some of those like beach LA shots, you know, which is usually this kind of a golden sort of colors. Well, you would want the colors to be more between the yellow and maybe a little bit into the greens. So as you're adjusting your colors, it's good to have the, the vector scope on and you can just sort of see if you're reaching that, you know, if you're going in that direction. So that means that overall the shot is balanced in those colors. Now, for example, I had set the camera to auto white balance, which is something I would advise against, but just to show you that the camera now tries to find sort of a like perfect sort of setting, like I said, what it thinks is the perfect setting, which is basically somewhere in the middle. So that's, as you can see, most of the information now is it's it's going into the, 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 the in the center of, of the vector scope. And now again, let, I'm going to change it to uh, to what I had before, which was daylight. And now, as you can see, we're back in the daylight setting as we had originally, and you know, which is the setting that I actually prefer. And as you can see, it's most still in the middle, but it goes again back to yellow and red. So that's sort of how you use the the vector scope. And like I said, and it's uh, not just for when you're composing your shot, but even when you're doing color correction, it's a really powerful tool. Uh, let's jump back here in the menu here. Uh, another cool thing about the, um, the Atmos is that, as you can see, you can have the vector scope or, let's say, the waveform on the whole time. And you can adjust, for example, the brightness of it and the, the transparency of all these, you know, tools. And also the size, for example. So, as you can see, if you can tap on it, you'll have it go across the whole bottom of the screen. Or you tap again, you can have it go full screen up here. Or you can, you know, kind of minimize it back to the corner. So now I'm going to show you the other cool features that it has, uh, you know, peaking, it's standard, most cameras now come with it, it just simply shows you the, the parts of the image that are in focus. So th this is, you know, built into the monitor in case you want to use peaking up here, um, you turn that off. It also up here is the zebra. So zebra just shows you the parts of the image which are overexposed. So that's another way of sort of judging, making sure that there's n not too much of your image is overexposed. So if I tell my assistant again to adjust the exposure in the camera and sort of overexpose it, put it to like, you know, 1 25th of a second, for example, you'll notice that here on my forehead now and, you know, on my hand up here, you know, these parts here are, are overexposed, especially that part there in the back. So, you know, that I'm, I, especially on the skin tones, I don't ever want to see the, the zebra. So now, for example, if I have the settings go back to what we had, as you can see, that's when the zebra disappears. Now, another really powerful feature that this monitor has is the false, false color. So let me just turn off the waveform here. And false color is it what it what it allows you to do is it allows you to re very easily judge the exposure of the image and um, and the way you do that is by basically it b takes away the actual colors from a shot and it just uh, it just looks at basically the intensity of the, of the pixels and it turns them into basically these color coded and you have a little legend here on the bar so you can on this on the left side so you can see if you go all the way to the bottom it's purple meaning purple is basically completely underexposed then you know if you're getting into these darker blues that's like really darks and then the gray gray means that it's 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 in the you know it's it's below the midtones it's 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 underexposed but it's not dark basically it's not black so as you can see you know behind me there that door is is in the grays that means it's going to be darker but it's not going to be completely underexposed versus for example if you're seeing there in the corner uh, it gets starts getting really dark so it's in those turning into those light and darker kind of blue colors now the same thing for when it, when it comes to overexposed parts of the image. Uh, if you go into yellow or kind of this orange color, that means that you're getting, you know, kind of hot. And if you go into red, that means that the image is overexposed. So if I adjust the exposure again and I put it down to 1 25th of a second, you'll see that as the image, you know, overexposes, you'll see that now, for example, I'm getting these, you know, s sort of the same spots as, uh, as the, the zebra was showing us before. You're getting, for example, these red spots here on the pillow there behind me uh, on the couch. And that, that means that those areas are just completely blown out. It's just, there's no pixel information there anymore. It's just pure white. Um, and, uh, and then also you'll see that I'm getting a lot of the yellows 
here on my, or my forehead up here and on my hand again so that again means that you're it's not completely overexposed, but it's getting there. It's very dangerously, you know, over, you know, uh, uh, up there basically when it comes to the, the brightness of it. So uh, I'll adjust the, the, the setting again in the camera to what we had before, which was a sort of nicely balanced exposure. And then another really good thing that the false color also has is it shows you the, the gray and especially this little area here, which is the pink. That shows you that that's like the ideal skin tones. Now, that doesn't mean that whenever you have somebody in a shot that they should always you know have that within it uh if, but it just simply means that if you're trying to do like a properly balanced shot with some other person in it let's say for an interview those are the kind of colors that you want and as you can see up here on my face uh you know you're getting a lot of the especially on the left side here on my face you're getting a lot of the the gray and then a bit of that pink that which means you're getting those perfect sort of skin tones or you're exposing perfectly for the skin tones so that's sort of how the the false color works and like i said it's it's a really powerful feature that usually comes in really really high-end uh sort of monitors that you, you know that you use in sort of a studio environment and it's really cool now that the atom s shogun you know has those features in it so uh once again if you guys are you know uh, looking for a, a good monitor but also an amazing 4k video recorder and also a really good audio recorder i would highly recommend it especially if you own the the sony a7s camera if you guys want to find out all the information on, on basically where you can find all the deals uh for the for this recorder uh then uh, check out my website at tomantosfilms.com and uh you know also over there i'm going to provide links to some of the other accessories and batteries and things like that anyways hope you guys enjoy this tutorial and i'll see you next time